Welcome into other people's shoes. I'm your host, Neil. Welcome back for our second episode on labels. I want to welcome my guest on today. Her name's Twyla. Twyla's going to be talking about why labels are good, why labels are bad. Did I mention she's a foster parent? She's also a bio parent. She's also a teacher in a high school. So she is around kids all the time. Are you ready for this? Because you know I am. Let's go. Hey, come take a walk with me. Not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction. Change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil. And tonight I get the privilege, or today, this morning, depending on when you want to listen, uh, I get the privilege of sitting with, again, I think she would probably categorize herself as uh, Team Elizabeth more so than Team Neil. Uh, but we do we do have a very kindred spirit. She would even probably agree with the fact that we probably should be more related uh, than probably my actual sisters in real life. But uh, without further ado, here's a very good friend of my wife's, and I would even consider herself one of my friends as well, Twyla. Twyla, how are you? I'm good. So, so Twyla, I think you might be busier than the President of the United States. Um, especially right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially with the government shutdown. But I'm ching. So that'll put it in the time frame if you're listening to this in the future where we're at. But uh, Twyla, you're you're a mom of how many? What are your what are the mom stats? We'll start there. Okay, mom stats. These are tricky. They are. So I'm a stepmom, a mom, and a foster mom. So I have between me and my husband, we have four kids. They are 23, 18, 14, and 13, and then we have fostered 10 children. So currently, we have six kids living in our home: four foster kids and two bio kids. Wow. And uh, I've started doing this new thing, so um, I, I wanted to get the mom stats uh, in there too because that to me is super important because I think the greatest gift on the planet is being a mom. I'm not one, obviously, but but I know the greatest <laughs> gift on the planet is being a mom. So this new thing I'm I'm doing is uh, Twyla. What size uh, What size shoes do you wear? I wear an eight. You wear an eight. I would not have guessed that. And then, uh, what is your uh, favorite shoe to wear? Um, flip flops. Okay. So if you had your choice, you're, you're just, you're rocking, you're rocking some flip flops. Yeah. Okay. So the reason why I asked that is because we're talking about, you know, other people's shoes. So I really want our listeners to really get into this idea that we're really in your shoes. So we're wearing eights and we're wearing flip flops. Yes. We're wearing those ones that Nike makes that are like walking on clouds or marshmallows. Definitely those ones. I love the Nike plug, too, because, you know, I, I always have this hope that, you know, somebody big will hear it and be like, let's get that guy some sponsorship. So oh. that's, that's awesome. So if I ever get those, you'll you'll be first in line. I so, want the Nike flip-flops. Gotcha. Fair <laughs> enough. So, uh, Twyla, describe to me your, your current role, because I know you also serve as a teacher in our school district here in Oregon. So I don't know how much you can really elaborate on what you do or, or, or what your role is, but... But if you could, try to describe that. Okay. Well, I'm actually an instructional assistant um, in special education. So I have worked in classes with behavior kids. I've worked in elementary school. I've worked in middle school. And I worked in high school. And currently, I'm in high school with low cognitive students. Okay. So help me understand. What is a student with low cognizant? Did low cognitive. That? Low cognitive. Thank you. Yes. Low cognitive. What is it? What is that uh, defined as? Um, there are students who are not able to independently um, access the school setting. Uh, they need supervision. Um, usually, about a hundred percent of the time, we do have a few kids who can get independently from one location to another, but they need a lot of of checking. Um, we have some students that are not able to bathroom independently. We have nonverbal students, um, and we have students who kind of run the gamut of verbal ability. And, um, yeah, they, they're they not quite doing academic-style skills, but they're doing life skills, so learning how to be as independent as possible. 
that's quite the challenge i would imagine yes <laughs> okay wow okay so here's my here's my first question um how do you define labels that you've seen placed on kids and that could be kids you know educated kids that you're you know kind of overseeing you know in your job but even you know as a foster parent because i know you've probably had some kids come in with some uh predetermined labels or pre-placed labels so how do you define that I think even just saying foster kids is a label. Um, and I've definitely had, unfortunately, school districts um, talk to me about those kids in my home. Um, that hurt. That hurt to hear that the kids that we feel like are our children temporarily um, are treated differently than any other children in the school because they're those kids. But they're not. They're kids. Um, as far as special education lab labels, <clears throat> uh, that one's really, really tricky. I prefer to just think of humans as humans, um, not worry about the other parts. But I think that when we understand all the parts that make up a human, then we can treat them uh, sometimes with more compassion, more empathy, more understanding, and in a more humane way. I'm going to use a word that that I know is probably just going to immediately ignite a fire with you, but but I know you don't like this word. I'm not intentionally trying to by any means light a fire, but some people use the word very very flippantly, the R word, that retarded word. Now, why does that word resonate for you as such a hot button for you? I can literally feel my body temperature. I rising. know, and again, I apologize because we're friends, and and I'm and you asking, know this, and I do, but it, but for me, I feel like it's an important it's an important topic because I know you're passionate about it, but there's a reason you're passionate about, it. and I guess that's what I want to come across right now is is why is that button so important and and so uh, again so inflammatory to you personally. There's a couple of reasons. Um, unfortunately. The word retarded just means lack of growth. So if we have a plant that um, is retarded in growth, it doesn't grow tall or big or what a plant is supposed to do. And the same thing's true of the human brain. Unfortunately, over the years, people have used the word in a der derogatory way rather than a medical, um, medical way or a term to identify a student's cognitive ability or a person's cognitive ability. So really, it's just a misuse of the word for so long has made it uh, where I would put it under the category of hateful language. And I'm not a fan of any hateful language. Uh, I feel the same way about when people say, oh, that's so gay or something like that. It's just it's hateful. Um, it's ugly and it, it hurts to hear that. The difference, I think, between using the R word and using other hateful words is this word is hateful about a population that can't defend themselves. That's hard for me. If you, if you use derogatory terms towards a race or towards any other um, kind of people, they can defend themselves. They can say, hey, don't talk like that. That's not okay. But you say it about a nonverbal student, they have no means to defend themselves against that sort of hateful language. And also to use something so flippantly in language as if to say, oh, that's just so retarded. It, it's just ugly, I think, in my students. And I think you wouldn't say, oh, that's just so Johnny about something that's stupid. My kids aren't stupid. Um, I don't think that people who typically could have been classified under uh, mental retardation, which we now call intellectual disability, I wouldn't ever say they were stupid. They're not stupid. They're incredibly capable. Their capability just looks different. And again, I'm... I'm asking for some extra liberty, so thank you. Thank you for breaking that down. But but in all seriousness, we've never had that conversation, right? Can you think of a time where we had that conversation? I can't. And so I, I know that was probably a little challenging for you, and, and I appreciate you, you giving me a little insight into that. So uh, going back into this label thing, uh, why should we not define kids by labels? Why, why is that so damaging in your opinion? Um. I can't remember if it's Ross Green. I should, probably shouldn't give him credit without knowing for sure. But there's someone very smart, much smarter than me, that's a behaviorist. And he says, if you call a dog by any name, he begins to answer. And I think when we label people, 
I begin to answer to that label. So if every day I show up and I say you're stupid or you're mean or you're dyslexic or if you're anything, then pretty soon you're going to believe that you are any of those things and that is going to be your best. But your best is not defined by a label. Your best is defined by your ability, your passion, your desire, um, your your God-given talents and strengths. And I don't think that it's okay for anyone to decide how far someone can grow. Okay. Uh, as a teacher, what's the biggest challenge uh, with your kids, if you can say? Again, I, I know we're kind of, we walk a very thin line here with what you can say and what you can't. But as a teacher, again, what is the biggest challenge with your kids? That's a tough one. Uh, the biggest challenge for my student with my students sometimes is, uh, the students I'm working with right now don't necessarily have the ability to find a logical response to things. So you can't, or I cannot, uh, logic with them say, oh, don't do this because of this result. They don't, they don't understand that. Um, It's very impulsive behavior or it's uh, behavior that's based on reward. So a lack of reward doesn't necessarily mean that the behavior will change, but with the reward, we can begin to change behavior, but we can't just logic with them. Don't run into a street. You can get hit by a car. That means nothing to the students that I have. So I think that's probably the, the most difficult Thing because I want to always keep them safe and I want them to be their best and to be able to do things well and so and to blend I think blending is a big deal I want them to blend so that students will accept them also and there's no logic so this should be right up your alley too uh, what advice would you give to parents who feel their child is labeled uh, or who have already been labeled what advice would you give that parent? Well, recently the the language around certain diagnosis has turned from saying you wouldn't say anymore that a child is autistic. You wouldn't say that this child has autism. You would say this child experiences autism. I feel like with anything that could be a label, we experience those things. There's times I experience anxiety. It doesn't mean that I am only anxiety. There's times that... I experience frustration. That doesn't mean that I have only frustration. So I think that always saying that there's there's moments in our life that could be defined by these labels, but there's moments in our life that are not. And so to say that we experience moments of ADHD or we experience autism or we experience those things, I really think it makes a big difference in not defining someone's ability at all times, but to say that this could be a complication in their day-to-day life. So, uh, as a, as a foster parent, do you think all of your knowledge and being a foster parent and experiencing what you've experienced, the interaction with, with the parents that you have, because obviously parents are making poor choices. Do you think those things have helped you be a better teacher in, in your, in the special needs field? Um, I think it's the opposite. I think that my background in special education has helped me to be a better foster parent to be more compassionate and understanding towards the bio parents. Um, I think a lot of them are going through something that's really, really hard, and sometimes it doesn't have logic involved. And sometimes they, the parents that I've kind of teamed up with to mentor on this foster parent track, um, they need a lot of compassion. They need someone who will support them. They need a cheerleader. And I feel like I've gotten that at school in learning how to help students succeed. And in that same way, I can help parents succeed. And I think we've been pretty successful in mentoring um, a couple of parents and um, being some support for for parents because, you know, they, they have made some bad choices, but that's not who they are. That's a moment they had, and I think they can rise above it. Okay, so this is from uh, friendshipcircle.org, and they were talking about um, you know, special needs kids and kind of how to parent those and, you know, maybe even how to educate them. And so they listed out eight things, uh, that may work. So I'm curious what you feel like, will these work? Will they not, uh, being interactive? Do you feel like that's a, that's a good thing? Like interacting with their children? Yeah. yeah, Like having interaction with them, keeping interaction with, with kids with special needs, why that's so important. (laughs) 
Okay, that makes more sense. Okay. Um, yeah, especially our kids with autism. We need to pull them out of the autism world and into uh, the everyday world. And so it's really important that that students that experience different disabilities where they want to kind of fort away and be on their own, that we pull them back into our world for a little bit. And I think everyone needs human interaction. Okay. And building on this again is, is having some observation, having some time to, to really, I guess, look into their world and try to understand where they're coming from. Why do you think that's so important as well? Uh, well, I think it's important that we know the motivation and the function of their behavior. So not just with kids with special special needs, but all kids, <laughs> you know, as parents, it's really important to think, why is my kid doing this? So um, when we look at the foster parent world, I, you know, some of our kiddos have come in with some really interesting behaviors. And I have to stop and think, why would they be doing this? What? This doesn't seem normal. This isn't something that my kids have ever done. This is something my family would ever do. So I stop and think about the family situation they've been in or the fear that they're feeling or the rejection that they're feeling or the uncertainty that they're feeling or the fact they have no control in their life and adults are making really hard decisions for them. And then their choices actually make sense. And I think, man, they're doing this way better than I could have at six, seven, eight years old. And this one actually troubled me in, in preparing uh, for our little sit down uh, because it's so it's so in my mind, it's so vague. And so maybe you could speak to this better than I could. But using common sense, why do you think that? I mean, because, again, when I think of common sense, what common is to me may not be common to someone else. But they use this phrase, uh, use common sense when when dealing with uh, special needs kids. And, and I'm not sure how that applies. But again, maybe you could speak to that better than I could. Well, I'm not really sure what they're what they're saying. If they're saying don't do everything textbook, um, or if they're saying don't overthink it, <laughs> or what they're saying. But um, I can tell you in the classroom, when we have assistants or teachers that have a pretty strong um, common sense talent, they do much better with the students. Because then it's also just the sense to realize like why they're doing what they're doing or or what's missing or or what the motivation is. Okay. And the other thing that they mentioned too is uh, being flexible. You know, some adults say that they uh, will not change the way they do things, the way it's recommended by another group. But the whole point is to teach, uh, teaching them using various methods to help other uh, to help the other person understand the massive uh, the mastering a new skill for an example if a child refused to uh, go with the parent being the parent uh, bring the parent into the activity for a few minutes to reduce anxiety so being flexible as far as you know seeing what the kid needs and, and kind of adjusting accordingly I, again I, I didn't come up with this list so <laughs> being flexible is huge <laughs> that is right extremely I would imagine it would be, right? important okay. <laughs> yes yeah yes we have to be flexible and we have to be flexible to remember that all students all people experience a myriad of different emotions and we have to be flexible with their emotions too some days um i have students that might be able to work continuously for five minutes but then other days they can work for one minute and I have to be flexible to realize what they're capable of that day um, and even, you know, change the reward system or change you know, what we're doing to meet what they're able to do that day. And I appreciate the people in my life that are flexible and don't think that every day I'm going to have an A game and 100 percent. We're human. And this one, I think, goes without saying, but but maybe it uh, maybe again it just builds on this. But being consistent, why why is that so such a key? I think everybody appreciates knowing what's going to happen next, and everybody appreciates knowing if I do this, this is going to happen. Um, my students know, you know, if if we have a picture schedule, they know it's going to go in that order. I'm not going to willy-nilly just switch up the pictures right in front of them. They know this is the plan, um, and I think that's good in life for everyone is the consistency. I think one of the worst things you can do as a parent is one day punish greatly for something, that the next day same same behavior, no punishment. 
then kids have no idea what they're expected to do. And we all do better when we know what's expected of us. Okay. And then the uh, the last one that they list, or sorry, second to last one that they list, number six, is uh, using visuals, uh, auditory, and, or tactoral uh, cues. Yeah. Is this an autism list? Uh, it actually just says special needs. Oh, okay. Yeah. So definitely in autism, we use visuals. So it's it's uh, eight important tips for working with uh, special needs kids. Yeah. Visuals are important. Um, I think then if we forget what's being said, uh, we can look back and see the picture of what was said. Uh, some of my students, their auditory processing is very, very slow. So hearing a noise and then the brain figuring out what that noise was, whether it's an alarm clock or words or whatever it is and what response to make, it can be very, very challenging. But seeing a picture doesn't seem to be the same challenge on the brain to be able to comprehend what's expected or what's coming next. Okay. And then uh, second to last one here we have, have a plan and uh, make a backup plan. Why is that so important for special needs kids? Well, because just because I make a plan doesn't mean they're going to want to go on the plan. <laughs> That's kind of like true imperating too, right? Yeah. I, I, I kind of laughed at that one as well because I was like, wow, uh, that should be everybody. But, uh, but okay. yeah. I don't know why that's specialized again to special needs kids. But Make a plan A, B, C, D. Did not make C, this list, D. just for the record. This is not, this is not my list. I want, I want that to go on record for that. But. I feel like every day when I wake up, I make a plan and I make a backup plan. And a third plan and a sixth plan. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. Too. Okay. This one I think is right up your rally uh number eight is uh, being positive why is being positive so important for special needs kids and just kids in general but but specifically special needs kids um i think when we look at when we look at ourselves and think why am i successful today as opposed to a different day or why am i doing more today as opposed to a different day i think often it's when we have a positive influence so if we think about the bosses we've had in our life the ones that are uh supportive and hey you did a really good job today we naturally feel motivated to continue to do that really good job, to, to go after that carrot of encouragement. When we have someone who's constantly beating down on us or, or even if they're just flat affect with us and not, they're not giving us any encouragement, but they're not also, they're also not like yelling, but there's just no feedback. It's discouraging. So, you know, our, our students are just like us in motivation Everybody wants to work for someone to be proud of them. It's good to be proud of someone. There's times that, you know, a student may do something that seems so trivial to the outside world and we're having a party for them. It's really encouraging. Everybody wants to be celebrated. I wish someone would follow me around all day long and just tell me positive things. I would be a better person. <laughs> just just following around and be like, wow, that's really great. You're you're walking so nice today. You tied your shoe you so tied amazingly. Tied your shoe. Well, it's a flip flop. So. <laughs> right. So yeah, you put on those <laughs> flip flops like amazingness. Yeah. Uh, almost done. Um, I am Twilight. I got to be honest with you. Uh, I've known you for quite a while. We've we've taken trips together. You know, our families have have uh, been interwoven for for quite some time. But you uh, you truly have always fascinated me from this respect. I want to know why you do what you do. I, I cuz I've always I've, that's always plagued me. I mean because cuz here's the thing, for me, you know, my job is is my job and 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 some people ask me the same thing like why do you do what you do? And I'm like, well, cuz I I love what I do. You know, my wife has a has a weird job that that I don't think anybody would do, but for whatever <laughs> reason she likes it too. But you know what I mean? You, you're one of those people to me again that fascinates me. You, you you know, you bring kids into your home, which not a lot of people would want to do. Uh, you, you know, I've heard some of your war stories of, of kids doing things to you, and, and we'll leave that out just for, for privacy's sake. But, um, and, and not that you're complaining, because you, you weren't, but, I mean, you're just sharing how, how your job is and how your coworkers treated you, so to speak. <laughs> but but I am, I, and I mean that in all sincerity. I, I am always fascinated by what you do, what you do. So why is it that you do what you do? That's so complex <laughs> of a question. I, I know it is. <laughs> um, I will say, okay, so I did accounts receivable 
for a couple of years. I loved that job. I did collections for a company. Who would ever do that? I, That's I, an awful job. I heard that they're bottom of the barrel scum suckers. So. Terrible people who ever do collections. Anyway, Team go bottom on. of the barrel right yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, they were business collections. That's the only Ugh. thing that makes me feel like like I'm not a total yeah you consumer know, and business. I think they're on the, the same level, but but nonetheless, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. So I did that. I really loved it. I had a bonus structure. I had a 401k. I had great benefits, but I also had a five month old baby, and I found a job where I could work in a teen shelter and take my baby with me, uh, and. How is that not perfect? Especially <laughs> as a mom, right? Right. Free daycare, so to speak. <laughs> right. right? So, well, I got to take him with me. So it wasn't even daycare. Yeah. He was with me all the time. I worked overnight. I could sleep at the job. Um, it was a shelter for teen moms. There were other moms and babies there. So I got to model behavior with my son. Uh, I got to go home during the day with my other kids and basically live the life of a mom who had a full-time job but was also a stay-at-home mom. So I left after my kids went to bed and I was home shortly after they woke up and then I had all day with them. But working with those teen moms, I think really changed my life. After a couple of months, I told my husband I could never go back to a desk job. I could never do it again. I loved it when I was there, but now that I had tasted that there was something so much sweeter in this world, I, I just couldn't go back. So I think that maybe wrecked me. That was <laughs> the undoing of me being able to work in like the professional world. Um, but I also mixed in with understanding that life is more important. There's things in life that are far more important than collecting money or working in, a, in an office or any of those things. Um, when I look at my spiritual gifts, I'm very high in mercy, extremely high in mercy and hospitality and encouragement and faith. I really feel like God designed me to be a lover of people. I, I love doing foster care. I love working with special needs students. I love what I do. I would be devastated to have to work in a job where I wasn't influence, influencing the lives of people. Um, but I really feel like God created me for this. That's fantastic, by the way. That's a great answer. Uh, last one, and then we're going to play a game. Okay? okay. I promise. I promise. This is our last one, and then, and then we can play a game. The game, the game is fun. The game makes me nervous. <laughs> the game is fun. Okay. It's called Senseless, so a little foreshadowing. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Going back to education, and, and maybe you want to answer this, maybe you don't. I hope you want to answer this. By the way, your friend Anna was on, and she answered this. So, okay. so she's a little She's for- amazing, though. She is amazing. <laughs> so if you haven't heard that uh, Anna episode, go back and, and listen to that because she did a good job. Uh, what would you change about the education system? Oh, so many things. You're like, where should Ooh, I start? This list How is long, long of a time do we have? Right. <laughs> Everybody, as much time as you need. <laughs> buckle in. This is going to be a long show. No, I'm just kidding. Um, about can, the, can you narrow it down to five? Or is that too, oh, is that is that about the whole five? education system? Well, sure. I mean, just maybe even in your little world, or uh, yeah. I mean, we'll go five things you would change. I feel like what's missing in education is relationships. Okay, so there's one. So we need to foster relationships between students and staff. Um. So many students come into the school that do not have a healthy adult in their life. And teachers are just a prime, prime candidate to be the healthy adult in someone's life. And um, forget the guy's name, former foster kid. I can't remember his name. Josh something, I believe. Um, he says every child is one caring adult away from being a success story. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Could you say that one more time? Every adult is, nope, I can't. <laughs> Every kid is one caring adult away from being a success story. Okay. One caring adult. One caring adult. And teachers can be the one caring adult or instructional assistants or the ladies on the recess, the librarian, the front desk lady. We all have an opportunity to influence the life of a child in a positive way. And unfortunately, there's so much top-down demand on our job that loses the focus on how we can be affecting children. 
Okay. Because so that's one. Number one was a relationship. Okay. And I loved your answer there, by the way. So number two. Number two. I oh, I got so into the relationship one. I think I, I forgot what the next one was. <laughs> um, the, other, the next one would be, we need to stop testing our kids so much. Okay. It's too much. Testing them. It's too okay. much. All right. Uh, number three, we need social skills to rate as high as academic skills. We aren't teaching totally students how to be friends. We aren't okay. teaching them how to have manners. We aren't teaching them how to be uh, caring and non-hateful people. Uh, we're missing those from the school. And I think social skills are huge. So that kid who's constantly having to sit on the stairs or stand by the wall or be in some sort of timeout during recess needs to learn friendship skills. He doesn't need to sit out from being those opportunities to be a friend, but rather be taught how to be a friend. So important. Okay. Uh, number four, we're missing life skills in the school. Mm -hmm. uh, there should not be anybody graduating high school that does not know how to write a check, doesn't know what the APR on a credit card is and how to find it. Uh, they need to know what bills are versus, you know, money that you just get to spend for fun. We need those back. We need parenting skills in the high school. Uh, we need a lot more life is that, skills. Is that your number five, parenting that was skills? Number four. Oh, that was number oh, four. Oh, that was number four is life skills. Okay. No, I put those together. Okay, all right. Number five? Yeah. Pay the teachers. <laughs> pay the instructional assistants. <laughs> Pay, pay, pay. This is a big deal. It is a big deal. Everybody who is anybody went to school. Your president, your congressman, your lawyers, your doctors, they went to school. Pay the people who got them educated. I'm sure there's more, but but five's a good start. We'll, we'll go with five. Those are really my top five. <laughs> oh, they really? Wow. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so you ready for the game? Are you nervous? I'm so nervous. <laughs> okay, so this is a game I like to call senseless. I just, I always point out the cup. Uh, <laughs> what is the cup, Twilight? Could you tell me? I think that's Duke. Don't even <laughs> say that. How dare you? It is a North Carolina cup. So oh. here we go. I'm going to let you, uh, there is a die in here. Somebody corrected me because I said dice the first show. And they're like, Neil, it's a, it's a die. It's one single die. Yeah. And I was like, no, they're dice. And they're like, that's two, you dummy. I was like, maybe wow, your teacher was paid don't enough. Label me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was actually gonna. I was. I was thinking Sorry. back. So, so I'll let, I'll let you kind of play with that cup and and the die inside for a moment. It's just a normal die, nothing fancy about it. But I was thinking back as you were talking about teachers and uh, to my education. I remember in seventh grade, I had a really amazing teacher who seemed to care and who seemed to want to get involved. And then when I transitioned into high school. Uh, you know, I had a couple other teachers that really were, were pretty awesome, spectacular people. Um, you know, I'll, I'll even name names. Uh, seventh grade was, was Ron Overstake. Yeah, that's his first name. So shout out to Ron, wherever he is now. Uh, and then uh, Janny Hale. Uh, I think she's long retired now. She was a Phoenix principal, maybe. I don't know. And then Jeannie Rasmussen. Jeannie specifically, um, like I didn't make it through freshman English without her. And part of it, we had Romeo and Juliet. We had to do that. And I was in that play in school. And so that, that helped immensely. But uh, she really believed in me. And then even elementary school, there was a, a lady by the name of Paula Mortimer. And I've actually tried to find her to to thank her because I believe in thanking people and thanking educators. So on behalf of all the kids that were IEP kids, I was one of them, dyslexic kids, again, one of them, thank you. Thank you for what you do. And, and I think you should get paid more. And I think teachers should be valued more. And so, and again, thanks for coming on. But we're not done yet, so you got to play the okay. game. So roll the die. Not not to be confused with dice. Three. Ooh, a three. <laughs> Don't say it like that. <laughs> I got to unlock my phone. This always happens. Like, I set my phone down and it locks. Okay, so number three. Um, do you want to roll again? Yeah. Okay. Why? Just a lot of people have gotten that number. So what did you get? One. Well, you got a one. Okay, this is good. You'll like this one. Uh, how do others see you? Okay, you won't like that one. I lied. I was going to say through their eyes, but that's just snotty. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I feel like there's a large population that sees me as a little bit obnoxious, a little too straightforward, and a little too lead with the heart. 
but I feel like the people that matter see me as kind, compassionate, caring, a little bit of spunky, and really darn funny. I th- I th- I think I agree with the last one at least. The that's because you matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with all of that. I I, I think that the, that's a very true assessment of yourself. So good job there, uh, Twilight. Any last thoughts you wanna you wanna add in before I wrap up? Before we wrap up, I should say. Anything come to mind? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Thanks so, for having me on here. <laughs> so uh, I'll add one last thing. So if somebody wanted to help out the foster care system, especially in Jackson County, because that's the county we're in. Now, I don't know how far this broadcast will take. I don't know where it'll go. I really don't. But if somebody said, you know what? I love what she's doing. I love her passion. I, I love her heart. I love her mercy. Cause all those things that I believe came out really clear, uh, today, uh, how could somebody get involved in, in perhaps helping Jackson County or maybe even changing some kids' lives? Maybe they have this benevolence fund of just awesomeness just laying around going, gosh, I don't know where to spend my billions of dollars, you know, whatever <laughs> it may be. But, but Do how you want could... my address? No, or... no, no. Oh, okay. but, but I mean, yeah, mine too. <laughs> just for the billions of yeah. dollars. <laughs> but I mean, how could somebody get involved in, in, in helping out? Because I know you also do some stuff with Royal Kids. and I mean, you are so active in so many, not only special needs kids, but just kids in general. You're, you're just a, really just a giant kid at heart. Oh, but... that's so true. <laughs> But how uh, how could somebody do you do you have a way that through your avenues and through your channels yeah. of, of how someone could could help out? And if so, sh- maybe share that. OK, so if someone wasn't ready to be a foster parent right. or maybe they're not in a place in their life where they feel like that would be an appropriate step to take. Um, the state of Oregon has an initiative called Every Child. You can look that up online. Google that. We'll put it Um, in the show notes too. Every Child. Every Child. Jackson County has its own branch of Every Child. They do a lot of really great things to support uh, DHS workers and to support foster families and foster children. So currently, um, the Every Child in Jackson County has an Adopt a Foster Family program, which they just changed the name to something else, something about a neighborhood. that's okay I, if you get it. I don't remember, it. but it was that, adoptive family. That, that's okay if you get um, it. Get it to me and, and I'll, I'll throw okay. it in. The, it'll be in the show notes. But okay. Yeah, we, and can, they, we can get it. Um, well, our family actually got chosen to be one of the families that Great. was adopted, which that's, has been amazing. Yeah, that's so awesome. we have a group of women that uh, rotate bringing us dinners once a week because uh, our our life can be really really busy. Yeah, again, give give the stats and... at home right now. Just, just right now, <laughs> as of this taping. Just what, right now, yeah, we as have of this six taping. kids at home. We have a two year old, a five year old, two seven year olds, a thirteen year old, and a fourteen year old. Anyone else want to do that? Show of hands, please. <laughs> I, we can't see them, but, but we're going to take your word silent. for it. Yeah, crickets <laughs> right now. So that's great. So so yeah. every child is, is a great way for folks to get involved if they wanted to get involved. Yes. Okay. The other thing you could do is call your local DHS office and they will point you in the direction okay. of whatever nonprofit um, is available or okay. if there's a foster parent association. Jackson County has an amazing association called the Jackson County Foster Parent Association. You can find them online also. Um, but they do take in kind donations of all sorts. Um, and there's just different, different things that people can do. DHS does have volunteer drivers that get kids to visits with their parents or medical appointments or other things such as that. And, you know, honestly, just telling the foster parents that, you know, Hey, thanks or, or great job, or I see you is great. There's times where I have taken kids that their parents didn't show up for a visit. So, let me walk you through this real quick. We walk into a lobby where they're expecting to see their parents. We sit there for 10 to 15 minutes. They watch every single person who comes to that door with the same amount of anticipation. And they watch parents walk in, meet up with their kids, and head back to the room where they're going to hang out. And they watch that lobby clear out of kids waiting to meet their parents and that door not opening anymore. And their heads sink. My heart breaks. I want to cry for them, with them, hold them. And then I have to think, what can I do to distract this kid? There is nothing in the world worth as much as a parent. No amount of ice cream, no amount of fun, no playground that's going to make them forget that their parent didn't show up to a scheduled visit to spend one hour of the entire week with them. That they don't rate high enough for that. 
So sometimes I take them to Costco (laughs) because if there's any place in the world distracting, it's Costco and they get to pick out whatever snacks we're going to have for that week and big, massive boxes of sugary junk and what fun (laughs) that is. I have taken kids into Costco where they are running around the cart. They are jumping in and out of the cart. They're climbing all over the place. They're a little too loud. They're singing. And I don't correct any of that behavior because these kids have been through enough. So maybe what every person can do, stop mom shaming, look around, and think, man, that lady has wild kids. I wonder if they're being taken care of. I wonder if they're okay. I wonder if emotionally they're settled. Because when I take my kids to Costco and they're running around crazy, it's not because I'm a bad mom. It's because they're not emotionally settled. And it's okay for them to get it out a little bit wild. Well, and what a great place to Costco because (laughs) it's huge, right? It's huge. It's huge. Uh, I'm one of those people that I'm probably getting in trouble and, and hate mail all over the place. I really don't like Costco, but but I've been with, we've run into you at Costco. My wife and I have, and I've seen the kids do that. She is not exaggerating guys nope. in any way. <laughs> and so, uh, by the way, just on your, your, uh, account of, of the parent not showing up that that's, um, I have no response to that other than guys, be a good parent. Don't, don't get your kids taken away. Do the right thing. So yeah. l- little, uh, you know, you know, sp- spay your Find healthy and, support yeah, and yeah. reach out. <laughs> get, if you need help, get help. So, so there it is. Well, again, Twyla, thank you. I, I said only a half an hour. We've gone uh, 41 minutes, so so you, you gave me 11 extra minutes, so thank you. Um, I just want to say again, and I'm, I know I'm probably repeating myself, but you, to me, are an exceptional person, and, and Gary, too. I, I I know we haven't mentioned him, but but guys, she has an amazing husband too, and and uh, he's just not as talkative as as you are because he probably couldn't get a word in edgewise between I don't know the when two of us. Have time? You probably wouldn't even <laughs> have time. But but they are they're an amazing couple, uh, Gary and Twyla, and uh, they're amazing friends uh, in my life. And and again, I just want to reaffirm uh, just the amazing work that you do. Keep your head up, and if there's anything I can ever do to you know be of assistance i'm i'm you know i'm always here and we're always here and you know that but just now putting that on the air so now it's it's solid it's can't go backwards no so if you ever tell me no no take backs i'll tell you to replay this just just be like hey remember that time i was on your show yeah go back and listen (laughs) you Uh, do want to babysit (laughs) so anyway anyway i I just want to close so thank you again and and guys again remember you know, when we're walking in someone else's shoes, it's it's all about perspective. So just remember, when you're actually walking in someone else's shoes, just keep that in mind that right now it's all about perspective when you walk in someone else's shoes. So thank you again, and uh, keep listening. We'll have more stuff later. Thanks. Thanks.